This is Jim Pruitt, and you listen to another episode of the Farm So Hard podcast. So I farm so hard, the employees want to find me, and then want to hire me. What's 100K to a guy like me? Could you please remind me? Farm so hard, this ain't easy. Working late nights, you best believe me. My grades can only go ace. Never want to see another B unless I'm Jay-Z. Farm so hard, let's get paid. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Farm So Hard. I'm your host, Jim Pruitt, and I'm joined today by one of the experts in the field when it comes to toxicology. And if you know anything about ED pharmacy, you're going to know this speaker. So go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, thanks for the intro. <laughs> uh, uh, this is uh, Craig Kokio. So I'm an emergency medicine pharmacist and clinical toxicologist down here in East Texas and Tyler, Texas at uh, Christus Mother Francis Hospital. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been working in the emergency department here for four years, but I've been at ER Pharmacist for almost 10 years now. I uh, did my residency training at Rutgers uh, uh, in, in New Brunswick. Uh, before then, I was at LIU where I did my PharmD. So made my way around the country a little bit, got tired of the snow and the traffic in the Northeast. So <laughs> we found our way down into Texas, uh, luckily cured both things. <laughs> so happy to be here, happy to talk about snake bites, which is kind of something I had to learn a lot about fairly quickly, uh, transitioning from the Northeast down to Texas. Absolutely. It's the same for me. Again, being being from my PGY2 in a more, you know, metro area, I didn't have many snake bikes. And then I went down to a more rural area and I'll start seeing these things coming in left and right. So I'm definitely interested. And just the the topic of today is going to be the use of crofab and antivenom in snake bitten patients. So I guess, um, just to get into things, to let the audience kind of know some more of the background, what are some of the, the distinguishing features of a pit viper snake and some of the other snakes that we can kind of come in into close with? Yeah, so, I mean, looking getting into snakes, it's, I mean, it, it, it's a huge topic. It's, mm-hmm. it's a huge specialty in and of itself, uh, I guess, in the animal kingdom. So pit vipers are, are kind of what we see most often in the emergency department in the United States. Uh, we do see elapid snakes, which is a different family of snakes. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the coral snakes. So we have three common ones in the U.S., the Eastern Coral Snake, Texas, and Sonoran. Um, and they're pretty much distributed pretty much right along the bottom of the United States. So Florida, Texas, and then in, into Arizona. I mean, those make up a small, small proportion of the snake bites we see. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas pit vipers, again, make up the vast majority of uh, snake bites we treat in the emergency department. Um, so within the class of pit vipers, um, we have uh, a few different species that are relevant to clinical practice in the U.S. So the crotalus species, so that's our diamondbacks, our mojaves that we're familiar with, so in western part of the United States and also eastern part of the United States as well. Uh, the echistrodons, which are the cotton mouths and copperheads, and then the cistruus, which are the pygmies and misaguas. Um, there's a lot of other pit vipers in that family. There's 65 different uh, throughout North, Central, and South America, and then hundreds if, if you really start branching out. But again, those three are the most clinically relevant to us in the emergency department that we see the most of. Um, yeah. So, yeah, some some things that we often pay attention to in the emergency department, or I guess just you know living in the South where you're exposed to snakes. Uh, it, it, it's it's really it really comes down to two of the main species so the crotalus so the the diamondbacks and then the echistrodons where i practice here in east texas we have primarily copperheads that's our the snake species we see most often almost i'd say 95 out of 100 bites are from a copperhead the other you know four of those would be from an echistrodon and then one the odd rattlesnake will sneak into our area yeah, that makes it interesting because I I think of it like a lot of times when people think of Texas, they think of like rattlesnakes, you know, and then you're saying the majority of your of your bites are not necessarily rattlesnakes. So I think that's so when looking at like kind of the pathophysiology, and I think you've kind of been able to have an extensive view of this with your your training to become a toxicologist. What are some of the basic pathophysiologies of a general snake bite? Like what's happening and why are people becoming so sick because of these? Yeah, I mean, so the snake venom itself is an incredibly complex pool of uh, hundreds of different components. So within the the, the snake bite venom itself, uh, we've been able to identify a, a number of those. We have, a, a, I guess, a little bit of an idea of what some of these proteins and 
uh, components do to patients, uh, but we don't really have a clear idea, so we can't really you know draw a level and, and say what's what's happening. Um, actually, I'd. I do want to jump back. There's a, a few other things with like just kind of describing the snakes themselves that I think are uh, relevant to talk about before we get into that a little bit. Um, so the, the pit vipers itself, so that they get their name from uh, uh, this, this pit like organ that is near their nose. So it's not a nostril, they, but they sense um, essentially their prey through that in addition to the forked tongue, but other snake species. So true vipers, uh, which are usually located um, outside of the United States, don't have that distinguishing pit uh, function. So the pit vipers also have uh, an, an elliptical pupil that's vertically oriented, um, another dis distinguishing factor. As well, you can also see um, uh, with, with these snakes, so they have front hinged fangs that act kind of like hypodermic needles where uh, once they bite onto their prey, they'll inject the venom from their venom glands. Uh, which is in contrast to our lapids, which again, the coral snakes, which have uh, front fixed fangs, uh, which uh, can also be used to, to, well, obviously to bite onto the, to their prey um, and inject the venom as well. But again, the lapids can um, have this hinged function on them. And what's interesting is uh, when you hear about people handling snakes, they can often get bitten without the snake even opening its mouth. So there's case reports and stories of uh, people trying to handle uh, a pit viper and um, getting bit or envenomated by the snake, having its fang go through the bottom of its mouth or kind of sneaking out the side of its mouth. So in general, it's best to avoid and not really try to interact with uh, any kind of snake uh, unless you're, that's your profession, unless you're truly an expert in that. Highly recommend against that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, you don't have to tell me twice. Not just the handle those things. I see those things. I'm getting out of mm -hmm. town, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, and again, some of the other uh, misconceptions about snakes is that uh, in the United States, at least, is that they only really exist in the southeastern or southwestern United States. Uh, but really, every state in the domestic United or uh, not domestic, but the mainland United States has a venomous snake species. And the only two states that have not reported a Envenomation have been Alaska and Hawaii, I believe. So any state, including Michigan, Maine, have had native envenomated uh, envenomations. So even if you practice in the Northeast, it's something to keep your on your radar. Um, know how to the basics about crofab and some and anabip, the the two antivenoms, and general first aid measures for snake bites. And again, it's one of those things that um, should really be incorporated into you know you know that self care module you get in pharmacy school because anyone can really become a, a, a victim of snake bites and, and treat, treat things uh, very similarly. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so some of the, those distinguishing factors like we were talking about with the, the pit vipers, um, but there's also some distinguishing factors with the lapids, so the coral snakes in the United States. So uh, if you've ever heard the, the saying, red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, venom lac, mm -hmm. so that really comes from the, the, the band, the, the colored bands that surround and uh, distinguish the American coral snakes. Uh, and it's important to note that if you're ever traveling or dealing with an exotic species, is that saying doesn't really hold up anywhere else in the world. So if you're dealing with a South American or Central American coral snake or something in, in Australia, uh, that rhyme really doesn't <laughs> hold up. So you could be envenomated by something that has uh, red on black. So it, it's something to, to, to be aware of. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so the the the, the lapids, they their venom causes more of a local um, instead of a local tissue effect or a hematologic effect, they cause neurotoxicity, mm -hmm. um, and the primary concern for them is paralysis. Now, the the way we treat them is is vastly different. Uh, there are antivenom products for both in the United States, uh, but again, the vast majority of bites are related to our pit vipers. And you would say like, what, what would be like the breakdown? Would you say like, the, you know, 90% going to be the, the pit vipers or kind of what would be the breakdown of like the numbers for those? Yeah, it's, it's roughly about 90%, um, maybe even higher. Uh, the, the elapids usually people don't get in, in touch with as much as they do with the, the, the pit vipers. Um, you can see some displacement happen, especially during hurricanes or if there's, um, new development, you know, construction or disruption of the, the snake's natural habitat, it might locate itself in more populated areas. 
and that can go for both species, but um, they're a lot more timid, I guess you could say, or people don't come across them as much as they would with uh, a pit viper. Yeah, because you, you won't find me going and trying to chase down any one of these these snakes. So, uh, so again, so we kind of talked about the distinguishing factors between the two and how that may not be the case once you leave the, the North America. But you, we also mentioned how there's kind of some different mechanisms of elimination when you're looking at, uh, you know, the elapis versus the pit vipers. But is there like any differences in like the composition of the venom or kind of we we see certain you know, hematological effects without as much tissue necrosis, depending on which, which, you know, rattlesnake versus copperhead or water moccasin. Is there any difference in those? Absolutely. So, yeah. So looking at the, the venom itself, there's, there's quite a lot of literature where you can get into the venom or venomics about the snake venom itself. That's oh, the wow. study of the venom itself. <laughs> um, yeah. But again, it, it, the venom is, is incredibly complex and we think, that some of the venom components we can attribute some clinical effects to. Uh, for example, with our echistrodons, which are the copperheads and, and moccasins uh, that we deal with, they have relatively larger representation of phospholipase A2 proteins in their venom, which are attrib- can be attributed to the tissue toxicity that we see with those species. Whereas if you take something like a diamondback or a western diamondback or a mojave, they have a relatively lower proportion of uh, phospholipase A2 represented in their venom, but much higher uh, other components, including things like snake venom metalloproteinases or serine proteinases, um, bradykinins, other hematologic and uh, neurologic-based toxins. And then you can have other species-specific toxins that kind of can further get their name from that species. So something like Mojave toxin, for example, um, has been linked to a lot of neurotoxicities. Um, there's crotoxin as well that uh, has been linked to certain species of snakes as well uh, that can uh, confer different types of clinical pictures that you see from, from these snakes. But again, in general, we it, it, it kind of goes back to our, our triage of these patients and, and initial assessment of these patients in the emergency department, where while it's interesting and somewhat academic to know what snake bit them, we try to treat each patient similarly without knowing what snake uh, actually bit them. So we're looking at local signs of envenomation. So if they have um, fang marks, for example, um, erythema, swelling, uh, redness, any blebbing, uh, hemorrhagic bullae, that sort of thing. And then the progression of the swelling throughout uh, the extremity or wherever they've been bit, uh, we try to pay attention to those things as well as certain lab parameters that we would measure rather than focus on identifying the snake itself or having the patient identify it. Um, And we know from some literature that patients are actually fairly poor at identifying certain species of venomous snakes. The one that most people are actually fairly successful at identifying is the copperhead, Uh, especially if you live in an endemic area, kind of like East Texas or in some of the Carolinas where that's one of the only snakes that we have around. People can identify that. But again, we try not to rely on that too, too much. Yeah. And I think it's key to just set that because I've been in a few cases now where we're, we got very concerned about making sure we identified that it was a, you know, was it a rattlesnake? Are you completely sure? And there's a lot of talk back and forth about that. So I think it's very you know interesting that you mentioned that. Look at this, look at the patient, look at your labs and treat based off that compared to, you know, trying to say, well, the patient identified it as this, we, sometimes they bring them in with them, you know, with the mm-hmm. head cut off. And that's like, it's not as important. Is that a first statement? It's not as important to do that versus just getting your labs up front? Yeah, so certainly not important. I mean, in some of the first aid recommendations that we have for snake bite management, um, yeah, one of the first things to do if, if you've gotten bitten by a snake is to get away from the snake. First of all, not try to take a picture or collect the snake to try to have us, you know, spin down and make some anti-venom from its venom. Uh, doesn't really work like that, <laughs> although it might work in the movies. Uh, that's not how we treat it. So again, general first aid recommendations are to try to calm down, get away from the snake, get to first aid if you can. So really identifying the snake is not uh, clinically relevant to us. Um, it'd be cool if you could take a picture on your phone that might help, you know, um, stratify or uh, triage, you know, how bad things might get or might key us in to look at coagulation parameters or uh, 
be wary of doing a good neuro exam on the patient. But again, those things should be happening anyway, uh, just to make sure, because there can be overlap in the in the snake's venom, depending on the species, especially considering how wide and varied our snake species in the United States can be. Um, and even we know uh, throughout the season, uh, in a given for a given snake or a given snake species, the venom can develop and evolve into different aspects that can be influenced by its diet, its climate, um, other snakes around it, how often it eats when the last time it ate was, how often it uses its venom, that sort of thing. Um, there's obviously a lot of kind of, I guess, old wives tales and things that we don't want to recommend for patients specifically. So things like uh, if they get bit, trying to cut the the site of the the bite to drain the venom away. Uh, that's not recommended. Uh, other things like the snake bite kits that you can find online for wilderness activities, those don't have any effect at all. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, applying a tourniquet would certainly not be ideal also. Um, those things are specific to, again, I should emphasize, those are specific to North American envenomations. There are other appropriate treatments that can look like that from snakes from through different parts of the world. But again, in North America, we don't want you to, you know, suck the bite, uh, shock the bite. Some people have tried, uh, apply any anti snake bite topical thing that you can find on the internet. Um, nothing so like cool, that. Just get, <laughs> yeah. Try to get to uh, healthcare as, as or healthcare provider as soon as you can. Absolutely. So we, we kind of talked back and forth about, you know, in, the different species. And you mentioned like, you know, it depends on what they ate this morning could be the determinant factor of how you actually, the, the venom itself and the composition. Is there anything about the, the age of a particular snake? Like if a younger snake may produce less or more venom, uh, is there anything about that? So in the literature, it, in, in the snake bite experience that, that it kind of looks like that's a misnomer, so to speak in that Younger snakes can't control their venom, you might hear, um, or older snakes know how to, you know, appropriately dose it. In the laboratory, you can look at the venom itself and say there are different representations of different venom components. But again, because it's so complex, uh, that may not play as big of a role as some people might think. And again, the juvenile snakes being not able to control it, that hasn't been proven necessarily um, it seems to be more of a of a myth than true science. But again, it clinically speaking, it comes down to, like I was mentioning before, giving a good clinical assessment of the patient rather than relying on, uh, again, identification of the snake and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, dry bites can occur, uh, you know, up to 25% of bites uh, from oh, venomous wow. species uh, can be uh, dry. And again, it has to do uh, with not necessarily when it ate last is the contributing factor, but again, it, it used its venom to eat recently. So it, has, it takes time for that venom to regenerate. Uh, so it won't be able to, to, I guess, deploy it until it generates enough venom again. So if you get in, involved with a snake that recently ate, the chances of you getting a dry bite are probably higher. But again, it's really hard to say with any kind of confidence whether that's, that's true or not. Yeah, these are all very, very interesting. So what are some of the clinical futures of these snake bitten patients that we should look for? And does this change depending on the type of pit viper snake that actually bit the patient? So again, uh, looking at the, the site of where it was, uh, where the bite may have happened. So if it's a, hopefully an extremity, a hand or a foot are usually the most common places that people get bit. Um, either because they're reaching into somewhere where they can't see, like a bush or into a pit, uh, like a hole, like a um, an area that's obstructed by leaves or whatever, or they're walking around in sandals in their backyard, that can happen too and get and get bit. So you want to look at the area, uh, see if you can identify fang marks. Uh, and then you, there's a, a few ways of kind of marking the swelling and the, the tissue effect around the bite. So in the a unified treatment algorithm for North American pit viper management. Um, and we can link to that article. It's essentially what most toxicologists recommend to follow in, in by way of a guideline to treat uh, these envenomated patients. So what they recommend is marking the leading edge of the erythema and, and swelling, uh, and then marking the time on that, and then watching for progression throughout the, the limb or wherever the, the, the envenomation took place. 
There is a alternative method that's uh, recommended or at least practiced by uh, the folks out in Arizona, which is where they'll take a circumferential measurement instead of the leading edge measurement. So they'll take three circumferential measurements uh, on an extremity. So say the arm, say you got bit in the hand. They'll take one circumferential measurement around your hand, around your forearm, and then your upper arm, and then mark what time and what measures they see. And then over time, they'll go back and take the same measurements to see if there's any progression of the swelling. And you can do that on a control arm where there has been no envenomation and see if there's any swelling at all. Um, so that's not necessarily recommended in the guidelines, but based on clinical practice, that's been successful in the practice out in Arizona. Um, for me, in my own practice, I actually find it fairly hard to identify the leading edge uh, for a patient. I'll be in with the, the medical team kind of looking at the patient on the initial assessment. And they'll kind of draw the line where they think the leading edge is, and I can't tell where it is. And you might uh, see some redness, but it seems like they're not drawing it exactly on it. Um, and then, you know, after a couple hours, the patient's arm or leg looks like a like a topical gra or topographical map <laughs> rather than anything that's really easy to identify. <laughs> so a nice cleaner method might be the circumferential measurements, but again, that's kind of practice dependent. Um, so after you're doing your physical assessment, uh, again, good ED care uh, applies to all these patients anyway. So ABCDE on all patients, primary secondary survey, making sure they're, uh, they have two good uh, large bore IVs hooked up to a cardiac monitor, um, frequent blood pressure measurements, good nursing assessment. Um, you can even do neuro assessments on some of these patients that you think there might be a neurotoxin on board. Um, and then uh, they don't necessarily need imaging, but imaging can happen around the side of the bite to make sure there's no retained, uh, uh, I guess, material. So like a, a fang or a tooth or something like that, but that's not generally necessary in most cases. Um, and then drawing labs. So the labs we want to see in these patients would be something like a CBC, coags with a fibrinogen, um, CK, um, and that sort of thing is what we're looking for uh, as an initial assessment for these patients. Um, some other places that have TEG, uh, have, we're seeing some literature come out where they're uh, doing a TEG assessment on these patients. Um, I think the literature is probably a little too early to really interpret what's going on with that, but it would be interesting to follow and see what happens uh, and how to guide therapy for that. And then also that depends on whether or not you have a snake that's causing a coagulopathy, um, which not all pit vipers are going to do that as well. So, uh, I mean, in the initial assessment, that's what we're looking at. Uh, and then in stopping to making sure that we're resuscitating the patient appropriately if we need to. Um, but again, venom effects can take hold uh, over a gradual period of time, so usually a couple hours. If there's neurotoxins involved, those are much more rapidly developing. Um, so you can start to hash those things out in the physical assessment um, and then start assessing the need for antivenom therapy at that point as well. Perfect. So we kind of got to the, this point, and there's a lot of questions that my providers give me and a lot of the medical residents ask as well. So let's talk a little bit more about Crofab and some of the other antivenoms. So one of the questions I got is like, where and how is antivenom produced? There's a lot of talk where it comes from cows, horses, uh, all these different things. And can you kind of give the audience, uh, how, how is this actually produced? Yeah, so the we, we can start with the newer product that's available on the market. So that's uh, Anavip, uh, which is a newer FDA-approved uh, antivenom for North American rattlesnakes. Uh, and again, it's, it's, a, it's important to know because again, it's in the package insert that it's specific to rattlesnakes. So it doesn't include the Echistrodon species. So co cotton mouths and copperheads are not included in the indication um, for this drug, but it's a, it's a FAB2 fragment. So if you can remember back to your biochem and you have your uh, FAB and then FC antibody. So this is the, the V portion. So um, the FAB fragment on top is retained and the FC portion of the antibody is cleaved off. And uh, so the way they get that antibody is that they take the venom from two snakes uh, that are native to Central and South America, uh, the Bothrops asper, which is also known as the lance head, and then a Crotalus durissus snake, which is a uh, Central or South American pit viper. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, they, in they inoculate uh, horses with the venom from these two snake species and then extract the, the plasma, extract the antibodies and um, 
which yields uh, immune globulins against the venom, and, and then, then they produce these FAB2 fragments. So they're uh, then obviously packaged and formulated into uh, convenient vials that we can reconstitute and administer to a patient. Uh, so the, there's a lot of differences, and we can continue to talk about it, but that's the, the basic, I guess, fundamentals of how Anavip is produced. So Curlfab is produced uh, in a similar manner, but there's a lot of important differences. So Curlfab is a FA, it's a, also an FAB fragment, but it is uh, cleaved by, uh, uh, well, it, it's cleaved vertically, I guess, if you could imagine that, that Y structure of the uh, antibody fragment yielding a FAB fragment. So you just have one portion of the V, so you cut a V in half and you have one side of the V left over, and that's what uh, CROFAB is. So you have your FAB fragment, um, and they get that antibody from, uh, or the, the venom from, excuse me, so the, the antibody is produced from uh, the venom of four snake species that are native to North America with CROFAB. So you have the Eastern Diamondback, Western Diamondback, the Mojave, and then the Cottonmouth, uh, which are the venoms in, extracted in the United States. It's shipped overseas to Australia where they inoculate sheep um, with uh, the, the individual pooled venom uh, from these, these snake species. And then the, the plasma from the sheep is uh, spun down. They extract the antibodies. And then it, again, it's packaged into convenient vials that we can um, give to patients. So, uh, in the cleaving process, they use uh, a few enzymes. So use papain and uh, so primarily papain for that cleave cleavage with um, crofab. Uh, so there's always this concern that if a patient's allergic to papaya, they can't receive it, which is accurate. Although I've never come across that. And most patients in East Texas uh, don't end up eating a lot of papaya in their diet. So usually that answer is no for us. Um, and then the I forgot to mention that the way that um, Anavip is cleaved is with pepsin. So it's a pepsin uh, digestion of the FAB fragment yielding that V molecule. Absolutely. And so now we know how it's going to be like produced and kind of where I didn't know it was good. Things are getting shipped to Australia and injected into sheep and it's coming back. And it's kind of a lengthy process. So exactly how, what is the mechanism of both of these products? So uh, the antibodies essentially uh, are, essentially they, they bind to the, the venom itself, the venom proteins that have found your way or found their way into the patient and inactivate them. So the inactivation happens almost immediately. However, the venom can be distributed throughout the patient actually fairly rapidly through lymphatic drainage or uh, just, just a distribution of the venom throughout the patient. So um, these drugs need to go everywhere. They, they bind up the venom fairly quickly. So you, you can see some response um, fairly quickly, but again, uh, the the way that they're dosed um, essentially with uh, crofab is you have your initial loading dose which we want to have initial control that's the third big endpoint for crofab we're looking for initial control with that initial loading dose and what that means is that we've halted the progression of swelling you're not going to reverse swelling the swelling that's happened or the tissue damage that has happened has happened um, but you're going to stop the progression of that swelling and tissue damage. And then you're going to see a normalization of any uh, coagulation parameters that have uh, gone awry. So they may not be all the way back to baseline, but they're certainly uh, approaching baseline and have dramatically improved. So one thing that gets lost in, in a lot of the confusion and the dosing of this, uh, both products, uh, is that we don't necessarily achieve initial control. So that's where you see therapeutic failures and additional courses of therapy where they need additional loading doses and uh, prolonged therapy outside of the generally recommended maintenance doses. So you continue to give this loading dose, the initial control, until you achieve initial control for CROFAB. Um, and then you start the maintenance, which is two vials uh, every six hours for three doses. Uh, Anavip. So Anavip, you... The initial dose is 10 vials. You also want to achieve initial control. Um, and there's an option for a maintenance dose. It's one, one, maintenance, it's one maintenance dose, but uh, it's not always required. So in the comparative literature that we have with uh, Anavit versus Crofab, 
the study that was looking, comparing both these in the North American uh, pit viper uh, population, I guess. So there's three groups in that study, uh, an FAB2, so Anavip, Anavip. So you get Anavip loading dose followed by Anavip maintenance. The second group was Anavip loading dose followed by no maintenance. And the third group was CROFAB loading dose with a CROFAB maintenance. So we ended up, we ended up observing, uh, again, the primary outcome of that study being uh, the prevention of uh, recurrent coagulopathy in, these, in this population. So there was more recurrent coagulopathy in the um, CROFAB arm, less coagulopathy in the Anavip arms. Uh, and it, that actually held up when we only gave the initial loading dose of Anavip. Um, it is important to point out that of the patients that had recurrent coagulopathy, uh, I don't think any of them were actually clinically relevant. There are labor laboratory parameters showing recurrent coagulopathy. Um, and then there is a letter responding to that paper, so kind of suggesting and looking at some meta-analysis data saying that recurrent coagulopathy is exceedingly rare in the broad pit viper um, population or patients envenomated by pit vipers. So we're looking at less than 1%, certainly probably around 0.5% um, occurrence of recurrent coagulopathy. But again, following the package insert dosing is generally recommended uh, for these antivenom products. And again, it, it, it really depends on guidance from a local toxicologist that has very, uh, a, a fair amount of experience and familiarity with the local populations and how the patient is actually doing. And that's one of the things that I had, I had a case that was pretty severe and I went back and forth and I called pulls of control before the patient even got there. And I really wanted to talk to them because it just didn't, it didn't all fit the book. The patient didn't have, you know, a large amount of swelling and I just didn't really know what to do. And the team was relying on me to kind of figure these things out. And it's like, well, let me call this one who actually knows a lot more about not only, you know, you know, envenomation as well, but how it actually occurs within our, our state. So I'm happy you pointed that out that we definitely need to reach out to pull the control. So we kind of talked about the, what the dosing would be and the literature re regarding that. Where in the ED particularly, what should be the role that you see your general, you know, ED pharmacist play with the management patient that come in with snake bites and the use of antivenom? Well, again, getting to the bedside early, um, being a part of the team, evaluating the patient um, is, is fairly critical because you're going to have a better idea of whether or not this patient needs antivenom, and then you're going to be able to get it started pretty quickly. So one of the things that uh, oftentimes, especially if you're a new ED pharmacist in a, in a place that hasn't traditionally had pharmacists, you'll often hear it takes forever for the antivenom to come up from pharmacy. Um, and there's some, I guess, old misnomers about how long it really takes to reconstitute the products that have contributed to that. Um, so really, it, 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 it really pertains to CROFAB um, and, and its, its reconstitution. And there, again, there's some misinformation about it. So the old package insert recommended a, a small amount of uh, diluent to reconstitute the product, and it would take forever. It would take a couple hours, maybe an hour or two to reconstitute. Um, all the while, the you know the ED is calling downstairs and screaming for the antivenom, but there's really not much that they could do. Um, but a couple of years ago, there's some more evidence that came out to suggest that uh, you can use a larger amount of diluent to reconstitute CROFAB, um, which leads to the product going into solution much, much faster, um, almost within a few minutes rather than waiting a couple hours. And the way that this is done is that... Um, Again, it's hard to translate into the literature. So they say put about 25 milliliters of the diluent into the vial, although the vial can't necessarily hold that much. Uh, so what you need to tell your IV room uh, partners is to fill it up or, and fill the vial up as much as you can. So you take all of the air out so that there's pretty much no space left. It's just diluent dissolving uh, and reconstituting the lifelized powder. So when you do that, it goes into solution much, much faster. They can pull it out and put it into the 250 cc bag of um, NS so we can get it into the patient a lot faster. Now, Anavip, again, is similarly requiring to be reconstituted. I don't have any experience with it since we don't have it um, here. Uh, we have CROFAB on formulary. But from what I've read, 
And from talking to some other people, it goes into solution much faster with uh, a, a smaller amount of fluid. So it's, it's not a clinically relevant amount of fluid that um, it's not really any different, but it goes into solution much faster. Um, but again, it's similarly administered with uh, uh, dil- or diluted again to 250 cc. So kind of making sure that A, the team knows it's going to take a minute for the antivenom to get upstairs. Uh, and then B, making sure you're on the phone uh, with your IV room, making sure they know how to reconstitute it, they're comfortable doing it, and you can h- try to help answer any of their questions. Since again, this isn't something you'll do every day. Um, and again, depending on how your IV room is staffed, you might not have someone familiar with it at all or covering on the weekend and they don't know what's going on. So really being there to help them out, figure out what's appropriate and how to get it uh, reconstituted faster is going to help things along. So um, at the bedside, again, that's your your primary role. Uh, you can also help out with a number of other things. So there's some recommendations on what to do with uh, the affected extremity of the patient. So most of the time what's recommended is, you know, say they're bit on the arm. Uh, you want to try to mobilize it in a uh, and have the team immobilize it and elevate it above the level of the heart. And this is somewhat counterintuitive to old wives tales because you kind of want to the old theory is you want to isolate the venom in the extremity before you give the antivenom. And then when you start the antivenom, you elevate, which drains all the venom, and then you have the antivenom ready to soak it all up. But what we've found is that if you elevate the extremity sooner, you can distribute the, the, the venom a little bit more rapidly, and you might have less local tissue damage. Um, so again, the way that it's done is they have a non-restrictive um, splinting and bandaging on the extremity that kind of help hold it up. Uh, some people attach it to an IV pole uh, so if it's an arm also with a leg, um, but you could just elevate it above the level of the heart that's comfortable to, for the patient. And again, making sure it's extended where the elbow isn't bent um, at you know a 90 degree angle, you want it straight. Um, so making sure that that's done, again, you can participate in making sure that the leading edge is being measured or the cir- circumferential measurements are being taken and obviously do the thing that we all hate doing, which is a medication reconciliation uh, and making sure that patient's not on anything that's going to complicate things. So antiplatelet agents, uh, anticoagulants, warfarin, doax, um, anything that's going to make the patient more likely to bleed and your threshold to give antivenom uh, that much lower. Absolutely. So just to kind of summarize everything we it seems to be the key thing for us to do up to up to this point is just making sure we have a, a great physical exam, get labs and, you know, plus or minus tech at, at, at this point um, and identifying the snake is not really a big deal versus just providing great ED, ED care. Um, I, I think the next thing I really want to talk about outside of this is, you know, can you kind of explain uh, why? providers should call poison control. So we, we mentioned a, a little bit earlier, but like kind of the overall concept of why we should be calling them, even we know what to do and what dose to give. So, I mean, in general, it's, it's great to get your poison center involved in any toxicologic case, uh, not just from the fact that it's free and you can get an expert opinion at, at no cost to you um, and also get some other perspectives that you may not be thinking about. But it's also important from uh, you know a surveillance perspective as well. So there's a lot of toxicologic databases that we can uh, use, and that are a lot of important studies that are coming out for retrospective data, um, giving us trends, giving us ideas of how things are working, therapeutics are working, and other interventions that are otherwise very difficult to study. So um, some of that come to mind are like the Toxicon and consortium that do a lot of this type of research from uh, the toxic database. So making sure you get them involved is very useful. Also, if you're dealing with a a snake bite that you're not familiar with, uh, either you're new to the area uh, or it's an exotic snake species, there's a lot of experts that they can get fairly quickly on the phone or that might be located at the poison center that can help with that. Um, So if you're dealing with an exotic that uh, you don't have an antivenom for, they have a a database of all the exotic antivenoms located in the United States um, that are not FDA approved. So it's called the antivenom index. 
Um, and it's managed by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums in the United States and it, with a partnership of the American Association of Poison Control Centers. So they, they have essentially a database, an electronic database of every single antivenom product in the United States. So say you're unlucky enough to get bit by like a black mamba or something like that. Uh, they'd hypothetically be able to locate if an antivenom exists, where it is and how to get it to the bedside as soon as possible. There is an alternative one uh, or an alternative service. So in Miami, so the Miami Dade uh, Fire and Rescue Service has a venom response program. Uh, I, and I'm, I can't, I'm not exactly sure how this came to be, um, whether or not they have a lot of exotics down there or it, it just came to be um, out of good fortune. But they also have a similar program where they have a lot of information about other exotic antivenom products that uh, you might find necessary for your clinical case. But again, the Poison Control Center can certainly be uh, extremely helpful in trying to set up any kind of transfers, uh, uh, NDAs, or uh, getting your IRB involved as well if you need to use one of these non-FDA approved products. And then again, just getting an expert on the phone for free is is incredibly useful. Absolutely. And the last question, a lot of people has, you know, have a, especially the ED pharmacists that didn't train at, and go to a fellowship for toxicology, we're all very interested. Like, what can we do to gain the knowledge? And, you know, what training should we be getting ourselves involved in so we can pass the, the ABAT test? Or be, um, <laughs> Yeah, so, um, that, yeah, that's that's the million dollar question, right? So, Again, like I, I just sat and passed for passed the the ABAT exam. So, uh, it, I mean, it's it it's been something that has been a career goal of mine for a long time. Um, I've been working on it, I guess you could say, for ten years. And I I didn't go the the tox fellowship route um, for you know a lot of personal reasons uh, that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. You know, you you want to get a real job, start earning real money, uh, you're kind of done with school and that sort of thing, but you still have this interest. Um, so what I did is I just tried to, uh, throughout my career so far, is stay in touch with toxicology, um, keep reading, keep studying, uh, do projects, um, which all help towards your credentialing process for the ABAT exam. Um, so if anyone uh, wants to know how to qualify for the uh, ABAT exam, you can go to clintox.org. Um, and there's a step-by-step process that you can go through and you can download the credentialing document, um, which essentially scores your career so far and see how many points you have in order to sit for the exam. So I don't remember the, the minimum number of points, but the first time I filled it out, I was nowhere near what, how many points I needed to even be considered to sit for the <laughs> exam. But it gives you a really great roadmap of what to do now. So say you've only done review articles. Well, now you know... Maybe you should get involved in some, um, I guess, primary research. Uh, either get in touch with your poison center to pick up some shifts there. And that's not necessarily what you have to do, but it'll give you an idea of what you're lacking and uh, how to get additional experience such that you're in better shape to be successful with the exam. Because that's really what they're trying to make sure you're qualified for is that you're going to be able to go to the exam um, and be successful. Uh, that's a whole goal for it. So again, through my career, I was just trying to make sure I was on the right track. That's a great way to do it. Um, and then started studying for the exam. So again, Clintox or uh, in the ABAT, they have a great study guide on exactly what's on the exam, what to study for. They have the breakdown of the exam itself, uh, which is incredibly intimidating because you open the web page and it's uh, the entirety of toxicology in addition to things like occupational health, uh, disaster medicine, um, some other field, like toxic, or, uh, not toxicology, of course, but um, envenomations, uh, natural toxins, the list goes on and on and on. And it's, it seems exhaustive, which it is, and it seems daunting, which it is, uh, but it's, it, that doesn't mean it's impossible. So um, kind of talking to someone that has gone through the process, you can get a lot of pointers and some tips on how to start tackling that information. So uh, the way I found success, successful um, and that have uh, other people have as well is you start breaking it down. You say, okay, I mean, you can read Gold Franks a million times, but you're, you could read Gold, Fang, Gold Franks you know, all day and all night and you still probably won't pass the exam. You have to start, have to start branching out. So 
talking to some toxicologists, you'll be able to figure out what you need to start reading, um, getting some experience uh, doing, uh, and that sort of thing. You can start building your uh, knowledge base over time, and then hopefully have enough knowledge to be able to pass the exam, uh, which is uh, pretty intense, I will admit. Um, so about the exam itself, it's a little bit different. So during my pharmacy school experience, I only had multiple choice exams. So looking at this exam was a little bit intimidating. So the first day, it's a two day exam. The first day is written. So you have four essay questions, um, three of which are clinical cases and the fourth is a literature review. Um, and they're broken down into question blocks. Um, so you're not sitting down and writing, you know, a thousand word or 10,000 word essay. It's, it's broken down into uh, groupings of questions related to the clinical cases where they have you go through, show your thought process and that sort of thing, and then recommend certain treatments. Um, it, I mean, that was certainly the most intimidating part of the exam for me. And then the second day was 125 multiple choice questions. So just getting your head around a, a written exam and not knowing really what to expect, um, I guess, put a little bit of fear into me to, to study a little bit harder, um, which which is good uh, because you get a false sense of security and, uh, I guess, hope until you sit, go down and sit for the second day of the exam, which is multiple choice. And I couldn't believe how hard multiple choice questions could be until I, until I started looking at these questions. And again, like, I don't, I don't mean to make this seem uh, a deterrent for anyone because it's certainly doable. Uh, it, many, many people have done it before and many people will do it after this, but uh, it, you, you just, you, you get humbled <laughs> by the multiple <laughs> choice exam quite a bit. Um, um, and, and truth be told, I mean, I took the exam twice, so I wasn't successful the first time. I was really, really close. I missed by two points. Oh, man. Uh, really put a, a fire under my butt uh, to study a little bit more uh, for the next year. Um, but yeah, the multiple choice really, really gets you. But it, 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 the, it, it's certainly a doable exam. Um, if you don't know where to start, the first thing to do is just find someone um, that is a DBAT. Um, they can certainly help at least figure out where you are, what you need to do. Uh, in order to prepare yourself for the exam and then um, hopefully be successful with it. Uh, but again, it, it, it's been a long time. I, it's not something you can just throw together and, and pass overnight and nothing against uh, BPS and BCPS, but it, it doesn't hold a candle to that at all. Mm, wow. like you really, it's, it's a totally different animal, but um, again, you have a lot of time to do it. Uh, there's, I mean, unless you really, really, really want to be a director of a poison center. Um, you, you, you have, I guess you have a time limit on it, but uh, really you, you, you might have, you know, 15, 20 years to dedicate to, to study to this and it's a worthy cause. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I mean, anyone that wants to do it, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, anyone I reached out to was that was an established DBAT. I mean, was more than open to kind of give me pointers and, and, and help out. And, uh, you know, it was useful to run things by or things that didn't make sense to me uh, throughout the course of studying. So, uh, yeah, it, it was hard. Uh, I'm glad it's over. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I'd really encourage anyone to do it. Um, if you think you have a, a love for toxicology, um, it, it's great. The the worst thing that could happen is you gain a whole lot of knowledge uh, sure. about yeah. it. And it really doesn't cost that much. I think it was like 500 bucks to sit for the exam. Oh, wow. So it's a little bit less than BPS and things like yeah, that. Yeah, it's so. quite a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good thing. So as we close out, do you have like any final thoughts about just toxicology in general or just uh, snake bites and anti-venom? Anything to kind of close us out on? Oh man, I mean, we could keep talking all day, <laughs> I guess, about uh, antivenom. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess the one big thing that uh, obviously surrounds antivenom versus crofab is the cost. Um, you see a lot of news stories about you know patients that get six-figure hospital bills, which aren't always the most truthful news stories. Uh, if everyone's surprised by that nowadays, um, because the, I mean, the markup is what it is with hospitals, but the acquisition costs are quite quite different. So say for, uh, the average vial of Anavip costs about 1200 bucks, whereas a, a typical vial, uh, 
excuse me, of CrowFab is about $3,000. So about twice as expensive, mm-hmm. excuse me. Um, but depending on your hospital contract pricing, that that difference is is quite a lot less. And I can't give you the exact specifics with our contract pricing, but that difference is much, 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 much smaller um, with our contract pricing. Um, so, I mean, knowing what you actually pay for it can actually help inform you whether or not it is financially relevant to you. Uh, so for us, that is a sticking point. We do want to make sure we're being responsible with uh, hospital funds, but um, it's looking further into it, it may not be as big of a deal as it might be purported to be in other resources. But then again, you do have to look at um, your snake bite population. So the one of the major concerns that we've had in this area with Anavip is that it contains uh, Central and South American snake species, whereas Crofab contains an Echistrodon, uh, which is the same family as the, the copperhead. So the, the confidence that we have in Crofab to treat our local snake species, the copperhead, um, is greater uh, than something that doesn't have that. Not to say that Anavip can't work for a Kistrodon species. It's just we don't have enough clinical experience with it yet to say that it does. Um, and then again, the clinical evidence in uh, the literature is surrounding um, coagulopathy. And we know with copperheads, we don't generally see coagulopathy and that's not something we're treating for. So the literature is essentially null for Anavip and copperheads, which is one of the main drivers why we've stuck with uh, CROFAB for the time being. Now, kind of like talking to some experts throughout the country that are have quite a lot more experience with this than I do, uh, their attitudes suggest that Anavip probably would be effective uh, for copperheads, but this is essentially just anecdote and theory. There's nothing to really back this up at, that, at, at this time, but certainly time will tell uh, whether or not um, that'll hold up. I don't know of any ongoing prospective evidence that's going to come out to, to suggest that, but um, certainly retrospective uh, evidence for what it's worth is going to come out uh, for Anavip and Copperheads, that, and that's going to inform our decision making quite a lot more. But um, I, I think it's really hard to not just jump at the cost and and jump ship to to Anavip at this point. If you're dealing primarily with Copperheads, it's certainly an attractive thing to do. Um, but just again, knowing the the clinical experience, the lack of the FDA approval, um, and just not wanting to make the wrong decision for the patient um, is is kind of why at least we've here uh, stuck with CroFab for the time being. Um, yes, it seems yeah, like it's so, like the opposite of a uh, of like Indexa. You like you know people don't want to use it because of the cost. Right. Now you got this here. You have like some, some you know some sketchy evidence, and it's like, well, <laughs> I want to use it because of the cost. So you kind of get. And I get, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess you could say like, yeah, I mean, obviously we're all cost conscious, uh, but I guess keeping index on the, off the formulary is at least bought us a cushion to make sure we're doing the right thing with, with CroFab for the time <laughs> being. So again, it's, it's just something we've, we've, uh, we've, we've tried to keep, keep a lid on. Um, and then, I mean, reading into to snakes, it's such a huge topic and there's, there's quite a lot of great experts uh, around the country that you can can read about. Um, um, obviously, other podcasts have, have talked about snake bites in the past too, but it's such a huge topic. Um, j- again, just kind of scratching the surface that we've done today. And uh, I, I keep forgetting to mention, actually, we have a paper coming out in AJHP, um, essentially talking about a lot, of what, a lot of what we talked about today, so, uh, uh, Anabit versus Crofab um, for North American pit vipers. I don't have a date when it's going to be published, but it's, it's accepted to AJHP. It'll be out sooner than later. Um, so hopefully we can link to that when, when I know it's actually coming out. Um, and it's got a lot more information if anyone's interested. Um, and just so you know, I mean, the, the initial draft of that, that paper had almost 10,000 words and unfortunately AJHP can only accommodate 5,000. So we, oh, had wow. to, we had to cut it back quite substantially, but I mean, this topic is so huge, um, that, you really get humbled when you start digging into the literature uh, and, and seeing the, the the breadth of experience that other people have and then the bridging of other specialties, not even just medicine, but again, into zoology and herpetology um, and, and, and really getting a respect for, for the snake itself. Um, and then kind of getting into some of the like random stuff that you might find with, uh, with snake bites. And I mean, one of the, uh, one of the things, <laughs> just fun fact with it, uh, 
Uh, I was watching Kill Bill the other day. Uh, <laughs> and if you know, like the, the assassination group that uh, they're all a part of is the, 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 the deadly Viper assassination squad. And what was interesting to learn is that they all had Viper code names except for Beatrix, which was uh, mm -hmm. Uma Thurman's character. So she was the uh, Black Mamba, right? Which is an Alapid, which isn't technically a Viper. Um, <laughs> so it was interesting to think that I'm sure Tarantino thought of that and that's why she was an outsider and whatnot. But uh, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can get into really off the rails really quick about snake bites. <laughs> um, oh, and then like all the drugs that we've developed from snake venom. So um, if you're into cardiology, you know that um, eptifibotide uh, came from uh, a North Am or a, uh, American Southeastern pygmy rattlesnake. And then agristat or terofiban came from mm. uh, a, a, a true viper, uh, the saw-scaled viper, which is not native to North America. So uh, just thinking about those drugs and how powerful of uh, anti-thrombotic effect they have uh, can kind of allude to, you know, how powerful some of this venom is and you know, how complex it is. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a deep, <laughs> deep, dark pit of uh, tangents you can get yourself no into. No plan intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So I'd like to thank you for coming onto the show today, Craig. I'd like to thank the audience again for listening to another episode, especially when it's a little longer for us. But it's a ton of information in here that's going to be useful for a lot of you guys out there. And definitely check out the show notes. Follow us on Twitter. I have all of that on the website. And again, for all you guys that's listening, just remember, you don't have to be a pharmacist. You don't have to work in the ED. You don't have to do any of that. But everything you do, make sure you farm so hard. We're out. Uh, well, all right. Yeah, I'm just trying to make my mama proud, huh?